I'm Jen Strader, uh, developer advocate here at Gradle, and uh, today I have with me... Yeah, I'm Jan-Luc Johannes. I'm a, a software engineer at Gradle, working at the, yeah, on the Gradle build tool. And um, uh, yeah, I work or worked a lot on the dependency management part of Gradle, which will also be a huge focus today in our webinar. Yeah, it, it definitely will. Uh, and so just be before we get started, so we can help uh, everyone kind of get the most out of this, I want to ask a, a little bit of a question to all of you. Uh, what version of Gradle are you currently using? Yeah. Okay. So we'll talk about some dependency management features today in Gradle 6.0, which are now all stable features you can use, but some of them were already introduced during different 5.x versions. So some of you might already use some of them, but maybe find out today how you can combine them with other new features. So it's interesting to see how many, for example, are already using 5.x versions of Gradle. What we see here is that uh, a good number of you have started switching to, to Gradle 5.6, which is great to see because it, it shouldn't be too hard for you to transition into to Gradle 6. Uh, a good number are on Gradle 5 and kind of as we expected, some on 4. It's, it's good to see that uh, there aren't very many people still using versions less than Gradle 4 because uh, that would be a, a bit of a migration path. But uh, yeah, so, so hopefully everyone here will learn a little bit of something, even if they can apply it to their, their less than 6 Gradle builds. Yeah. And we see that there are also some people who are not using Gradle yet, yeah. but so the features we'll use, we will show today, some of them are really new improvements in Gradle, which you don't find in many other build tools. So maybe there are other reasons for you to yeah, start looking at Gradle. Yeah, so, so let's, let's just dive in. Uh, we want to, to really dig into dependency management on all of the things that have changed, particularly things that got promoted in 6.0, and, and Yender's gonna walk us through all of these things in a, in a really nice demo. Uh, we're gonna talk about the, the separation between uh, API and implementation, uh, what you need to know about uh, kind of de declaring what dependencies are there, uh, platforms, as well as publishing. So if you're a library author uh, or, or even just publishing things internally. Uh, so text fi uh, test fixtures, which are a really cool feature uh, mm -hmm. that hopefully everyone will start using after this uh, mm -hmm. webinar. And then kind of some things that you, you might need to do when you get more advanced into the dependency management world, uh, maybe fixing some, some metadata that uh, is published that doesn't doesn't fit your needs. Uh, but it's not just about dependency management. Today we're going to talk about some improvements to other parts of the tool chain as well, things that uh, Java, Groovy, and, and Scala users are going to want to know about. And uh, if you're a plugin author, please stick around for the last section uh, where we're going to walk through some things that uh, are going to be helpful and beneficial to you. Uh, yeah, with so, that, go ahead. Yeah, let's. Uh start with diving into, into a little demo, as Jen already said. So we'll use a consistent demo project throughout this webinar, so um, to show how also, or also in particular show how all these dependency management features interact, uh, also, and also with the other features. So um, we're just using the setup um, you see here in this little diagram we prepared. Um, it's an yeah, abstraction of a kind of typical application, how it could look like, so we have uh, one project or one component that uh, represents our data model and based on that we have several um, service projects um, providing services based on the data and um, an application on top of that that uses all these services. So as you see we named these here like uh, Groovy service and Java and Scala service that's because we want to show how different JVM languages will or can interact in Gradle um, but we'll get to that a little bit later. For now we want to start to look at the dependencies and you see that we also use in the sample some external component like Guava or JUnit for testing. And there's also the thing down here, which is a platform component, which is a special uh, feature in Gradle that we have now. And we'll get to that in, in a bit to show you uh, what cool things you can do with that. So the first, so we split this up in a few topics and we will jump between the demo and some summary slides. And the first uh, topic is API and implementation separation, which we want to talk about. Um, and yeah, let's go into the demo, demo and look at it there. So I've prepared the project um, here, which uh, corresponds to what we've seen on the slides. So it's a Gradle project, a Gradle 6 project uh, opened in IntelliJ. And um, so if you look at the settings file, which you use uh, to define um, which projects make up your multi-project, how we call it, if you have several projects in one. Um, 
So we have all the um, single components there. We have the data model, we have the different services, we have, and we have the application on top and the platform, which we will get to a little bit later. And you see the same here in the folder structure where we have the folders representing the different uh, parts of the application. So I want to start with looking into the data um, component first or focusing on it. So I've prepared a little uh, snippet of Java code here. Um, so just for demonstration purposes, it's a message class that just holds, I can open this, it just holds one string. So um, yeah, so this re so should represent your data model. In the real world, of course, you would have much more classes in here. So um, this is now just a, a folder with a Java file in it. And in Gradle, um, if we look at the build script, what you want to need to do to make it actually a Java project is you need to apply a plugin, right? And so most of you who already used uh, Gradle for longer um, are used to applying the Java plugin here. Um, but since some time already, we have this Java library plugin which is now the preferred plugin to use if you do Java, and in particular, if you do libraries. And with libraries, it's a bit broad meaning. It's basically everything you want to reuse in another project. If it's locally in a multi-project, or in a separate build, in a composite build, or if you publish it um, uh, using the published version of the, the project, or the component that you get when you publish the project. We will also show that later. Um, so OK, that's already fine if we do this, and we can tell uh, IntelliJ to, um, to uh, reload this. And um, so IntelliJ takes the information from Gradle, right? If you have to, your project defined in Gradle now, it's all working very well. And you see now our hello class here is recognized as a Java class in a Java source folder, which you see on the markings here. So everything is fine in the data project. And now we're going to switch to the service, to one of our service projects, the Hello Java service. and um, yeah, let's first make this project also a Java library project, plugins and Java library. So we are using the Gradle Kotlin DSL here, as you can might have seen already on this uh, file extension here. But also you can see um, that I use the code completion in idea, which works really, really well now with the Kotlin DSL, if you use it. Uh, so we import this and you see, okay, the main folder is also recognized now as a source set, as we call it in Gradle. And um, so I prepared a little service class here, the print hello from Java service, um, which is not doing very much, but uh, a few things. So we get a message in here. We use our data class we have seen before. Then we use some utility from Guava to check, do a null check on the message. And then we add a bit of um, additional string, string here, print it out and return it. So a few things you can see in this class. One thing is that we are using uh, recent Java features. So for example, the uh, inferred variable type here, and also the multi-line strings, which is a preview feature in Java 13 you can use when you activate previews. So you can already see here that this works now very well with Gradle 6. Um, of course, what we are missing here is some types, right? We miss our own data type, the hello message, and um, the strings utility. So in Gradle, when you want to do that, or use types from other projects, or also from external dependencies, um, you need to declare dependencies. Yeah. And that's what we talk, talk about, right? Dependency management, declaring dependencies, and so on. So you use the dependencies block, which uh, most of you might know. And what you used to do in Gradle is this. You write compile, and then what you want to depend on. So we want to depend on a project, and in this case, our data project. But IntelliJ already marks that as deprecated. Right, so that's uh, new now in Gradle 6. So the new thing is that something <laughs> is deprecated. <laughs> uh, but it was actually good because we already discuss discouraged this for some time and said you should, if you can avoid it, don't use this compile configuration, how we call it, um, anymore. And it also says here that you sh should use, instead you should use implementation or API configuration. Um, so the name is a little bit hard to grasp, it's a little bit generic, the name configuration is historic. Um, what this mostly means is that we have different buckets of dependencies, so different groups where you put dependencies in for different purposes. And we will look at what the differences are and start with implementation, um, which you should also do if you're not sure, start with implementation and then go from there. We will see on the example how this um, works. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we have an implementation dependency to data, which we need, and we also use this external library like Guava, so we need to add uh, Google Guava, 
Guava. And let's use this version here. 2411. And Guava has this appendix to its version. So I hope that is correct. <laughs> let's see. Yeah. Like so oh, that was the wrong one. So um, you see that um, the types are now available, right? I have the strings class from Guava. I have my message class. It's also all linked in IntelliJ. If I click on this, you see it moves me here over to my data project again. And um, so that is all working very well. So to demonstrate what this difference is between implementation and API, we need an, another project involved, actually. So we look at our application project. Um, um, let's first look at the build file. Uh, so here we didn't apply the Java library plugin, but the application plugin, um, which is another plugin you can use for Java development. And the diff well, one difference is that you get this application block where you can, as a minimal configuration, define the main class, and then you get a run task, which we will also use to run the application. And the run task then knows what the entry point is. So this is already configured, and I have written this main class here already. And um, same effect as before, we see that it's missing some types. In particular, it's missing the, the service. So I want to use the service to print, print this hello webinar audience message. And it's not there, of course, because we haven't declared any dependencies in the build file. So let's do it like we did before. Um, dependencies, and we want to have, again, implementation. And a project dependency to Hello Java service, right? So let's let this load. OK, so now we see that this type, the print hello which from Java, which we have defined in the, um, in the service project, is now available. But we still see that there's an error here. So it's underlined red. And it says it cannot access the hello's message class. And um, why is that? So we actually use that type, right, as on the API of our, of our service. Uh, and so it's used here. And um, so when we compile against that or use that, um, the compiler also needs to know about this type. But this type is actually not known because in our build type we said, okay, in our build file uh, for the services project, we said this is something we need to, implement, uh, to compile, which is the implementation dependency, something that our implementation compiles. Um, but we didn't say, okay, this is something that's part of our API. So other projects that compile against myself, they also need to know about that because it's part of the API. Okay. And then what that's the difference if we say API here, it means exactly that, that this type is, you can say, re-exported to the consumers of this project or the users of this project. So we def define an API here. And because we have the dependency here to the service project, the API dependencies will also get visible. So now if we um, re-import this, we see now that everything is fine and the type is available here um, automatically because the service said, OK, if you use me, you also need this types from this um, dependency of myself. Yeah. Um, so another way to visualize this is to actually look at the dependencies. Um, Gradle is using internally to compile and run things. So well, we can first run the application to see that everything works, actually. So let's run it using this run task. I see it's working, it's printing the message as expected, so that's fine. <laughs> and um, yeah, and we can also look at the dependencies of the application. For this, Gradle has a built-in task um, to analyze dependencies, which is just called dependencies. <laughs> and um, uh, you get, can give it a parameter, uh, which is another configuration called compile class path, which shows the compile class path. Um, um, which is actually used as an input to the Java compile uh, task by Gradle. So, and we can see here, right, that we see the hello services service of which we depend directly, but we also see the data project, which was the dependency, this API dependency of the service project, right? Yeah, but Guava is not there. Exactly, yeah, because it's only an implementation detail and it shouldn't be visible for compilation. But another thing we can look at is the runtime class path. That is what the run task is getting as an input. And if we look at that, we see that Guava is now there. Yeah, because at runtime, of course, I need all the jars uh, on, the, on the runtime class, because otherwise it would break. 
So um, using implementation is not like throwing away some information. It's just information for Gradle that in certain context um, it doesn't or shouldn't, shouldn't show certain information. Like implementation details of a library should not be on the compile path, class path of an application or service further up. Um, yeah, which shouldn't see this type and shouldn't use it without saying I depend on it. Okay, so let's switch back to the slides to summarize this. So the first thing we have seen is that we use the Java library plugin and the application plugin for the application pl uh, um, project. And so as, we, as I said during the demo, it's uh, recommended now to use one of these. So decide to build a library or an application and then decide for one plugin. Internally, these plugins still apply the Java plugin, which you might be used to to use this directly. But if you use the library, you get these API dependencies, for example, as an additional feature which you wouldn't have uh, if you only apply the Java plugin. Um, so if you are unsure in the beginning, just use the library plugin as the default. That's basically the recommendation here. What's the difference then with the application plugin? Uh, you said that, so we talked about that uh, you get the main class, you get the run. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so basically the application plugin gives you this feature to run, to define the main class. And it wouldn't give you the ability to declare API dependencies, for example, because an application is nothing that should be reused in another, in another project. Um, if you, I mean, if you, if you are in a situation where you have some other plugins, like, I don't know, var plugin to build a web application or something, that's probably another alternative um, to use here. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But, but it's important that you can't uh, use the API one there. Because, yeah, I mean, and it makes sense, yeah. right? Because yeah. you shouldn't be going yeah. beyond that. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, just another short slide to kind of give a bit background why this compile configuration was deprecated. So you shouldn't use this one anymore. There's also another one called runtime which you shouldn't use anymore. And the reason why we introduced new configurations here to keep these still working for some time, but then have the separation between um, API and implementation, which we have seen in the demo. There's also compile only and runtime only for specific cases which you can use. And then when Gradle actually says, okay, I resolve the dependency, how we call it, so actually gets all the transitive dependencies and the jars in the end, which belong to them. We have s separate configurations that you can, you know, that the Gradle task used to actually get hold of the jars, but which we also used in the dependency report. And they like uh, combine different things here, depending on what. So runtime class pass will basically get everything and compile class pass will only get your own dependencies and what's on the API of, of your dependencies. So Gradle can ask basically those questions like, give me everything I need to compile or give me everything I need to run. And in the background, this is, uh, well, this is working because we now consider each project or each component to have multiple variants, which we call variant aware dependencies management. I just mentioned that because that will come back in the other topics as well. So that's basically the technical or conceptual foundation for, for all of the features um, we are looking at now. Okay, we'll do another poll first. Which, which of the plugins do you use, right? Okay. Okay, so. So just to kind of get an idea of what constraints uh, or what everyone is currently using yeah, for yeah, yeah. dependency so, management. Yeah. So some of the features we are going into now are, well, in a way replacements for external plugins we had before, but um, adding some more on top of it. Um, so it would be interesting to see how many of you already use advanced dependency management techniques in a way by applying some external plugin like the quite popular Spring dependency management plugin, for example. Um, so yeah, doing the demo or in the slides we can also mention some relationships between between things, yeah. um, the Gradle features you have now and and the ones provided by the plugins. Yeah. So we've got a, a fair distribution here, uh, a good number of Spring Dependency Management users, which I was kind of expecting, some Android people uh, who are probably going to have some questions that are specific to Android and especially how Android uh, does some of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few Nebula users, uh, happy to see that. And of course, we added the build scan thing in here just to, to kind of see what everyone was, was using. Uh, yeah. yeah, so so thanks everybody for voting. Uh, we'll get back to the uh, constraint section and, and hopefully include some of this information for you. Yeah, so let's uh, just go to the demo directly now to, to show you why you should even bother with this. <laughs> so um, as the example, I wanted to do something in our application. So we have used Guava before as a utility library, 
So let's assume we also want to do something in our app, like using the string Narshek, for example. So we had the strings uh, utility class, right? And But it's not on the class part of my app, so I can't use it right now here. Um, so I need to add the dependency to Guava. And we added this in the service, if you remember, but it's not visible in the app because it's an implementation detail of the service. So what you should do in this case is you shouldn't like make it API here because it's not like you need it always, right? It's just that in this specific case, it would make it coincidentally basically available. Yeah. And, and what if I want to use a different version? Yeah, for example, you can also do that to add it to a different version. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's do that and maybe use a bit older version here. <laughs> And um, yeah, if we do that, and um, we import this, I hope it's getting available here. Yeah, so we have it here, and let's just do something to, for the purpose of the demo. So yeah, so Guava is available here, and now let's see some interesting things that can happen with this. Um, let's look at the compile class pass again first. So we now see, okay, Guava is on the compile class path, right? It's directly a dependency of this, um, of my project here. So this is the root like, and so it's here, and it's not like part of the service project. It's here because I depend on it directly. And the one from the service project, the dependency of Guava is still hidden. And, but what happens if I look at the runtime class path, right? Because then I get all the dependencies in there. And yeah, so now we see an interesting detail is here that my version has changed, right, from 23 to 24. Yeah. And that is happening because Gradle does a version conflict detection and also resolution if it can. So we have both versions coming in from here. There's a 24 version coming in from the service project and the 23 version because we depend on it directly. And Gradle detects the conflict and then it resolves it. And the default behavior, if you don't specify anything else on the versions, is that we treat them as so-called, we call them required versions, which means I'm allowed to update the version. Of, a higher one is probably fine. And so that's what's happening here. Gradle takes the higher version because upgrading this is acceptable, downgrading this is not basically in this setup. And um, it's okay in general, but of course here we have situations that the runtime class pass differs from the compile class pass, right? Yeah which can lead to, um, yeah, to unexpected things like something maybe was removed in the newer version, so it will break only at runtime. So usually in a project you want to like, have consistency, right? Use the same versions everywhere, um, at least if you can end up with a situation. And so now this compile uh, or this API implementation separation kind of led us to this issue, it's kind of a better, bit of a negative side effect, but we can um, prevent it. And there are also a lot of other reasons why you need to redeclare dependencies in different spaces, places. So an ideal thing would be to just remove the versions here everywhere. So this was in our application project and this is our service project. So we remove them here and define them somewhere else, right? So if I, if I do this and try to run my application, then of course it, it won't work for now because I didn't define a version. So but this is how some of the other plugin uh, work like the dependency, spring dependency management one and the, the nebula one, right? Exactly. So in these plugins, you do, do can do something similar. And these plugins, which are to a large part also based on older Gradle APIs that were around before, they just basically add this version here. They, they take this declaration on your build script and then add it at a version from another source. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what Gradle now offers is um, so-called platforms, which you can define as a separate project in your multi-project. You can also publish and use them. We'll show that a bit later. Uh, to define a platform, you just create a, one project with an empty Gradle file, and then you just apply one plugin, which is not Java library this time, but Java platform. And um, then you don't need to put any code or any other files into this project. You can just use the dependencies block. And inside the dependencies block, we have a separate block here called constraints, which has also been around for some time now, but it was incubating and for some time, but now it's stable and all, you can all use it without concerns. And um, in this block, you define, as the name says, dependency constraints. And dependency constraints uh, are information about dependencies, like you know, constraints which you want to put on them, like saying, okay, only this or that version is allowed, but it doesn't define a dependency per se. So, we can say that constraints, if you have them in your, in your builds, 
that they only get activated if the dependency is actually there. So here we also have configuration, like um, here it's API basically because the constraints are something you want to export. It's also not, um, constraints can be visible everywhere if you want the same version everywhere because they don't force in a dependency. They just used if a dependency is already there. Um, so, and then we say, which version did we had 24, right? So, and if we define this version here, we have this constraint and then we can go to our project and say, I want to use the platform and that's actually done similar to depending on other things. So it's also a, I should use code completion. <laughs> uh, so you depend on a project, but you also need to say to Gradle that this is a platform on which you depend. So it's, in this case, it's a specific kind of dependency. So you say, I don't want to, like a library, I don't want to have sources or JAR files from that project. I want to have only the dependency constraints from that project. And so what you can do is, I mean, there are different patterns you can use, but one thing is to add it to all projects, which you could also do in your root build script in a for all subprojects block, for example, if you want to use like this pattern and have them everywhere. And yeah, now let's do that and try to run our application again. I think it's conflicting with. Okay, so first thing we see is that it that it worked down here. So the the application ran. It cleans this, and also have a quick look at the uh, runtime class path again. And what we see now is, in addition to the services and Guava, which we declared as dependency, we also have a dependency on our platform project which is not adding any code or something because it's yeah, just providing dependency constraints. And we see that this constraint is here, um, which is indicated by the C. It says this is a constraint. And that's also part of this dependency graph if Guava is actually on there. If it's not on there, this constraint wouldn't, wouldn't be here. So if we, for example, would remove Guava here and then look at our compile class path, which should not have Guava on it anymore, right? Because it's uh, otherwise, only an implementation detail further down. Then we see that this constraint of the platform, which was in there before, um, is not there anymore. So we don't have Guava in there at all because it, this constraint was not activated because we don't have Guava. Um, yeah, so that's a really nice way of uh, sharing dependency constraints or dependency versions between all your projects. And um, there's more, but there's more you can do with the versions actually, um, because sometimes it's uh, getting more complex, uh, which can easily happen. So let's uh, look at another um, use case. Uh, so let's assume that in our application we don't depend on Guava, but we want to do a dependency injection and use these other Google libraries, this Juice, um, for dependency injection. Uh, so we declare it here, and in our platform we define a version. Yeah, which we should now always do for our dependencies, ideally. And use 4.2.2. Okay, let's do that and let's look at our um, runtime class path again. Um, this, yeah. this looks strange. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, for, first of all, it, it upgraded to 25, which is a different version than we were expecting. And, and this isn't even an Android project. Yeah, yeah. So Guava has a specific versioning scheme, right, where they always publish Android and a JRE version, mm -hmm. which is just a name for this is a Java 6 compatible version, and this is a Java 8 compatible version, which adds some more Java 8 specific APIs and utilities on top. And so the separation is there for Android, Android users that uh, need to stay on 6. And, um, but Gradle doesn't know about this detail. Yeah. So it just assumes because this number is higher, it can upgrade to it, yeah. And where does the version come from? Well, we have to look into our graph and we see that um, this version was actually, um, where do we see it? Down here, right? So Juice actually also depends on Guava, but they defined that they need version 50, 25 as a minimum. And because we are still following this required version semantics here, or Gradle is following it, 
um, it's still doing this upgrading. And the upgrading is also true for dependency constraints. It's not different than versions declared on normal dependencies. So it says, OK, I can also upgrade the constraint to 25. But maybe we don't want that, right? We want 24. Whatever happens, we want 24. And um, maybe it also works fine with Guava if we test uh, with Juice if we test it. And for our, our usage of Juice, it's fine. Then why why shouldn't we use it? And to understand that, we need, we can look at a concept uh, which we introduced in Gradle some time ago, which is uh, rich versions. We call it. So if you open this configuration block on a dependency constraint, or you can also do it on a de normal dependency, then you have this version block in here. And in there, you can see that there's, for example, this require um, statement. And we can remove the version here and add it here. And that's exactly the same semantics as before. So basically, what we saw before is a shortcut for a require version. And if you look here, we also have a lot of other, um, yeah, another, another, uh, other API you can use. So for example, you can say a version is strictly, uh, which means, so a strict version means that exactly what we, what we want here. So it means um, take this version, and even if further down my dependency graph, uh, there is a, a higher version, don't upgrade, but downgrade the higher version. So that's uh, yeah, a feature you can use for that. And there are some other things here. You can define version ranges, for example, and then you can say, I prefer a version in the range, or also reject a single version in the range. Um, we'll have an overview of that on the slide, and then you can also look in our documentation for all the different things you can do here. Um, so we can define it like this. And now if we look at our class pass again, we can see now, OK, the strict version here was resolved by Gradle to that version, the one we wanted. And also if we look down here into the details between the juice uh, dependencies, we can now see that this 25 Android version was downgraded to the 24 version, um, which we wanted here. Yeah. And uh, one last thing on this, so because this is a more common use case than many other things, um, there's also a short notation for that, which you could use. So you can also do, instead of strictly, you can use double bang here, which means it's a strict version. So you turn this required version. It's not a required version anymore, but a strict version. Uh, yeah, I think that's about what we wanted to show as the basics for platforms and dependency constraints. Um, maybe one last thing to mention is that this constraints block, you can also use it directly in a project. You don't need, not only in a platform, but also in a Java library project. If you, for example, have a de transitive dependency like the juice one and want to force it down and you don't have a platform, you can also use constraints um, in any dependencies block in any project. Yeah, so as a quick uh, summary, we saw that we have the Java platform plugin to define a platform, which is a pr project only containing uh, dependency constraints, so no source code or other artifacts in there. And um, so that's an alternative to a library and application. So a project can't be both a library and a platform. So we do a separate project for that. And um, so we also see here that the Java platform is separate uh, and, and not really dependent on the others. But uh, it, it, and we see the, these names. So it's, it's Java, Java platform, Java library. Uh, we probably could have even called it Java application instead of application. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But uh, what, what if I have a, a, a groovy project that I'm working on? Uh, will that work for, for the Java platform? Yeah, that's a good point. So this uh, the Java platform, basically, yeah, we could maybe call it a JVM platform, um, can be used with any JVM-based language. So Kotlin, Groovy, or Android. Um, you can yeah, use that for everything. And uh, also the Java library is something that you can now combine with everything. So you com combine the Java library with Groovy, or with Scala, or with Kotlin and have the API implementation separation also in these languages. Because in the end, it's all compiled class files, and it's all dependencies with shards, basically. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully that'll answer uh, <coughs> some of the people that have been, been asking ah, okay. questions. But, uh, and and we'll, we'll get to, to hopefully all the questions uh, when, we, when we get to a good stopping point. Or, okay. or yeah. some of them I see we're going to follow up. Yeah. We later. will also get uh, to the Groovy and Scala Kotlin uh, part, part uh, later. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so that's just what I said, a uh, little overview here. So just to remember, you have this uh, rich versions block. So you cannot define the version here, but open this versions block. And then you have all kind of options here. And yeah, we will publish the slides later. And here's a link directly to the documentation where all the combinations and also the useful combinations of things are enumerated. So maybe if you have a special case, you can find.
some things there. And maybe one of one of the other th uh, nice things to note here is that because so especially when when these uh, constraint blocks get so big or or you reject four to one in particular here, maybe mm -hmm. you want to explain why. Yeah. Uh, then uh, b because is going to be your friend. Yeah. Uh, so this is a special construct. It's not only a comment, but it's a comment that also Gradle records and uh, can represent to you in reports like the build scans. You can see this, uh, this reasons then. So that's really helpful mm -hmm. to use. Yeah. Your transitive dependencies are going to see that too, right? Yeah, exactly. When you publish with our new Gradle metadata, which we will get to in a moment, <laughs> or use it locally. Yeah, and um, yeah, and that's just to remember: if you depend on a platform, use the platform keyword, and you can do the same for published platforms. The platforms can be published and actually existing BOM files, which you might know about, which are very similar. So you have this dependency management block in there in this POM XML format. And that's also listing a number of versions. So this will be like a platform with required versions. Um, so you can use like the Jackson BOM, which exists now, or other BOMs, the Spring BOM. And um, yeah, that a feature, that's a feature many people use, the Spring dependency man management plugin, for example, for. And um, yeah, you can now use do this like like this. Yeah, okay. I think that's about the topic for now, and so we can move to publishing now, right? Yeah. Um, so should we we ask about what like kind of a baseline of, of what everyone's using to to publish right now? Yeah, or if people uh, do publishing at all? If, yeah, and, or if they <laughs> publish at all. Uh, so let's go ahead and launch that poll. Yeah, and I have to say I, I really appreciate uh, everyone that's that's voting. It's yeah. a it's a, a good number. Yeah. yeah, it's really helpful to see this a little bit because yeah, we also have this new and old publishing mechanism in Gradle, or the new uh, Maven Publish plugin basically, which is uh, we will also talk about now. And it's good to see that a lot of people already use that <laughs> because that's another point where uh, something got deprecated. So this upload archives, which is the second point in the voting, um, is now also deprecated and. If you still use that, you should see how, if you can move to the new mechanism, which we will also talk about now, so get some info how that works or some of the differences. So let's close that and share that. And yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, just, yeah, real quickly, it's good to see that everybody's using kind of the Maven publish and new stuff. Uh, if you're using that upload archives task, uh, this next section is gonna be really helpful for you. Yeah, uh, yeah and many of the other uh, mechanisms are actually building on the Maven Publish, and we're also having a close eye to see that everything works out with the new features we have, and um, so let's jump into them. Yeah. So to start this, maybe for also for the, the, the audience that doesn't use publishing until now or doesn't maybe also need it, but maybe in the future a scenario comes up. Um, so we, here's the demo project again, and in the demo this is a Gradle multi-project, right? So all the projects are available locally, and Gradle knows all the information then about the project, so it knows what is an API dependency, what is an implementation dependency, and whatever other detail might be needed to resolve these dependencies and conflicts between them correctly, or things like the strict version we defined. Now, if you publish things, we could imagine a scenario where all these uh, components here or projects are developed by separate teams, they are separate Gradle projects, and for example, um, the data model is developed by one team and they just publish this into a repository, and then the other projects just consume it from there uh, by depending on the published module with, with a jar in it. And um, our goal here is to offer all the features we just saw also in this scenario. So don't have lose any information basically over this process where something got published to a repository and then retrieved. And for that we need to add metadata to the um, to the published component. And because we couldn't add all this information to a POM file, which is a standard metadata format kind of everyone uses in the JVM ecosystem. Um, we developed over the past two years our own format, the Gradle module metadata, which we'll see in a moment, uh, to carry all this information which we can't represent in a POM. And with Gradle 6, um, this will be automatically published if you use the Maven Publish or IV Publish plugins. So how does it look like? So let's look at our data project. And so um, you might think, especially if you haven't used publishing before, that it's really complicated to get started with it. You kind of need a repository and then files are uploaded and so on and so on. But actually, if you just want to try it out or kind of get into it, it's, it's not very complicated now because as usual with many features in Gradle, you start by applying another plugin, which we already mentioned. So, and a lot of you use this already, so the Maven Publish plugin. 
And um, then you get this uh, publishing configuration block, which I'll just uh, copy from here. Let's see if IntelliJ also wants to recognize it, but I can start. So there are basically two things um, uh, you have to configure if you, when you start. So one thing is a repository, which is the location you want to publish to. Of course, in a real scenario, you, this might be like an artifactory server or something, some product where you can publish uh, Java libraries to. But you can start by just publishing to a file, local um, folder. So in this case, we just say uh, this repo folder is subfolder of our root project, and then things will just be published in local file systems. So that's a good way just to start publishing and try it out in a sandbox. And um, the second thing you need to define is what you actually want to publish, which we call a publication. Uh, so you do this by uh, this construct. You have this publications container. In Groovy, the syntax looks a little bit different. Uh, you give a name, which doesn't really matter. If you only have one publication, it doesn't matter which name you give. And it will also be the recommendation to have one publication per project if you don't do something very special. And then this, configuration, this publication needs to be configured. So basically, you say what you want to publish, which artifacts, and so on. But with the new publishing mechanism, all this information is already prepared. So the Java plugins packs, puts this into uh, something that's called a component in Gradle. Again, a very generic term, but um, it's a mechanism where plugins basically can put in the information. Um, what does someone need to know if it wants to use this project? So the Java plugin puts in all the information, like the so dependencies, and if they have API and implementation, and also like is there a strict constraint on something? And that's all in the component. You can think about it like this. So we only need to say, take the Java component and publish the information in there. And then we are already done. And um, we get a published task, which we can run. Let's do this. Um, for our data project, we run the published task. And um, I don't see much here, only that it happened. And you see here that this repository folder was filled now. So it's there. And if you navigate down, you have this typical structure. So this org Greg, Gradle Hello is a group. Um, actually, maybe I can show this very quickly. I defined this here in the root file for all my subprojects. So that's where this comes from, <laughs> just to mention it. Um, let's go back to data. And so that's the typical structure of Maven repository. Uh, or the, yeah, so, so that um, also other tools like Maven, for example, could find what you published. Well, that's a lot of. Uh a lot of things in there. And uh, so some of those look different than my Gradle 5 build. Yeah, yeah. So we added some things here. So at first, if we only look at the artifacts, so there are artifacts and checksums. Mm -hmm. And um, so in Gradle 5, you would get the jar file, right, and the POM file. And then you would get the, uh, these two um, checksums. And we now added um, the two safer ones in addition. And in the future Gradle version, we also will have some tooling or some functionality to actually check the checksum. So um, uh, yeah, this is the first step in a more secure direction. And what we also added is this file here, right, which you see now. So let's first look at the POM file. Um, what you see is that there's not much in there. Um, so only the setup stuff and the generic con uh, information. And that is because the data project didn't define any dependencies, right? And uh, the most, uh, well, most of the information you can put in the POM file are the dependencies. But what we also put in the POM file is this um, comment, which lets Gradle know that there's also additional metadata available in this module file, which is a Gradle module, module metadata file. Yeah. <laughs> and if we look into that, it's a JSON format. We also have this gener general information there. Um, but one thing, the first thing to notice is that there, before we get any information about dependencies or any other details, there's first opening this variance block. So that's basically or, or we see here that we consider each component to consist of multiple variants, and the number of variants you can have is not fixed in the format. So in a Java library, if you don't do anything in addition, you have two variants, which is API and runtime. And these are there to distinguish these two variants we actually used in the implementation and API separation. Um, so if you define API and implementation um, dependencies, the API elements variant or the API variant will only have the API dependencies and not the implementation ones. So that's basically the one um, another project will see if it says I compile Gradle, so I, I want what I need for compilation. And yeah, so we won't go into all details and there are a lot of other things that can be added to this file depending on what you do. 
One thing to see about Java, for example, here is that the version is also published you used to compile. That's information Gradle actually already uses. So if you try to consume this now, pull this into another Gradle project that's on Java 8, for example, um, it will fail telling you that you can't compile this code before it even tries to compile and gives you a weird error. It will already fail during dependency resolution. Say, okay, there's nothing I can find in this component that can be used here usefully to compile Java code. And um, yeah, so uh, one other thing about publishing, which we can see if we also do it for for the platform plugin. So let's go to the platform build file here, and you can also publish the platforms. I should use code completion. So just the pipe Maven publisher as well. Um, we had the same configuration. So of course, again, if you publish all your projects and have actually a multi-project, you can do part of this in the root build file, like defend, defining the repository. And the only difference here is that the component here is called Java platform, uh, which is filled by the Java platform plugin. And if you publish this one, so let's do platform publish, um, we can see that our repository, I have to go deeper, um, also has a platform now in there, and same version as I defined them from all the projects. And the first thing you notice is there's no JAR file, right? <laughs> um, because we only de uh, publish dependency constraints. And so the POM file is also generated in a Maven-friendly way, let's say, as compatible as it gets with, with Maven. So we see here, um, for those of you who use, are used to the concept of POMs, know this, um, there's this packaging POM, which basically tells uh, Maven, or also all the, the Gradle versions, actually, that there is um, yeah, no JAR file, but just dependency information. And then you have this dependency management block, which we already mentioned, um, which can also be used to share dependency constraints in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. But there's some stuff missing from here. Right. So we see, right, we remember Guava was, should have been a strict version, right? Yeah. And there's like no tech here or no, no syntax for strict versions. Um, that's why um, if we look at the module file, which Gradle 6 will use, yeah, um, we see that the same, similar information here. We have our variants, but now we have the dependency constraints also published. And you see that for Guava, we have strict, strictly here. And we see in general that there is a versions block. So it's quite similar to what you define the build script, actually. So if you want to, would add a reject here or a prefer, it would also turn up here. So we can publish all the constraint information that you can define a build script, we can publish or do publish now uh, in the module meetup data file. Yeah, so we might get to that um, in an other part in the demo again to see some more things that will end up in the metadata file. But let's just have a quick uh, recap of this part. Yeah, so we saw again, okay, we have the Maven Publish plugin, which you can apply on top of Java Library or Java Platform. There's also Ivy Publish if you work with Ivy, which is now, if you use Gradle 6, actually, and only use Gradle 6 to publish and to consume, you won't actually have a difference in the behavior because what, what Ivy does is publishing not a POM file, but an Ivy XML file. But with Gradle 6, it's also publishing the Gradle module metadata file and we use that one. Yeah. Only if you are yeah, using all the, all the Gradle versions are concerned with compatibility with Maven or Ivy, then you can choose one. But if you are just new to this, you should probably use Maven because it's like this thing that's most used in the, in the ecosystem. And um, another thing you can do, which I haven't shown in the demo, is you can tell Gradle now that you also want to publish Java doc jars and sources jars, um, which is required if you re do an open source library, you want to publish to Maven Central. Um, so it's just easily to configure now. And then everything is added automatically. So for example, the Java plugin will then add this information to the Java component, which we've seen, and then it will also automatically get published if you publish the Java component. Yeah, so yeah, we've seen that in the demo already, right? You, you end up with all the files, and then you have this marker in the POM file, which will redirect uh, to the module file. And if you do Java doc jar, it will be published here, and it will also be mentioned as an additional variant in the module file, actually. So you could implement something in Gradle to ask um, all the dependencies for the Java doc, for example, without having to directly reference the file, which is more or less what you have to do, had to do before. And yeah, and we have seen the same, that platforms can also be published. And in that context, we have seen that this dependency constraints block is there containing all the information, which would also be there for library if you use dependency constraints in the library directly. Yeah, OK, that's uh, about it for the basics of the publishing. And 
we have some additional features we want to we wanna look at, which you can use directly in your build if you're working with Java and JVM languages, and also go a bit into testing. Yeah. So the first thing um, we want to talk about test fixtures. Uh, a concept we have now to, yeah, to share code you need for testing, like setup code or test data code. Um, for that, I also have prepared something in our sample project. Um, so if you go back at the service, uh, it's this um, Hello Java service. Um, you see that there's already this test folder, uh, which you get if you apply Java library plugin. And I have uh, written a little test here for the print hello service. Um, so same situation as before. We don't have the dependencies yet. So um, I'll just see that I copy things from here. Um, so. Maybe to, to recap, because something was also added at some point, um, is that in Gradle you can use different test frameworks, right? And there's now, for example, the distinction between JUnit 4 and JUnit 5. So in this example, I used JUnit 5, um, which you have to tell Gradle by saying the test task, you have to tell the test task which uh, testing environment you want to use. Uh, the default is JUnit 4, but uh, with this use JUnit platform, you tell Gradle to use JUnit 5. So. And then you have a dependency to JUnit API, uh, and you also need for JUnit 5, you also need to select an engine to run the tests, which is one way, to, one uh, applica applicability of the runtime only um, dependency uh, configuration, which we have seen before. So here it's the same for test. We also had test compile before, and that's also deprecated now, as you can see here. So it's basically the same thing as, as for the normal um, main code uh, configuration. Um, yeah, so what do we do? We check if our test is working. Before we go into details here, so yeah, let's just see. So, yeah, because you should uh, ne never trust a, a test you haven't seen fail. Um, yeah, so we had the project <coughs> Hello Java service, and in Gradle we can run this check lifecycle task which will run our tests and other checks if we would have configured them. So we see the test is failing because my assertion is slightly wrong. You can see here there's this plus and that was not printed by our service, which is what we expected. So I should remove this additional plus here and then run the test and it passes. And now I have a quick look what the test is actually doing. So we have an assert equals here we call our service, which we instantiate up here. And then the service um, takes a sample message as an input. So we need to create some sample data right, to test. And well, in real world projects, there's usually some more data getting in. right? And you might also like maybe read it from some test data files or, or database even. And um, then we have multiple services here. right? We haven't looked at the other ones yet, but we have more here. And in real world, it's probably the same case, you have a data model and several things depending on it. So it would be nice if you could actually set, share this test setup code as part of the project or the place where it is defined. And that's what test fixtures is for. So let's remove this here because we don't want it, want it in here. We want to have it reusable in another place. So let's go into the data project. And what we can do is to share the code, we can now use test fixtures. And to use them, we apply another plugin. Uh, so uh, it's called Java actually again, Java test fixtures. So all these are called Java, I think more or less for historical reasons, but they always work in combination with all other JVM languages. So you can use other languages to implement your test fixtures. So what this plugin is doing is um, several things, but one thing is it's adding a new source set, how it's called in Gradle, which ends up in a new source folder here for Java. And if you would also play Groovy, Groovy would also be available here. And I already prepared that. So in this folder, you can now write code that's only there to support your tests, like setup code or, as I said before, test data. So we just put the method we had before in here to create our sample message. And if we have that, we can go into our, back into our service project and now say we want to use the test fixtures from our data project. For that, we just add another implementation on the data project, this time for in our test. Um, scope here uh, by using the test configuration, uh, test implementation configuration, 
and we have to tell Gradle to use the test fixtures instead of the main variant. Because in the end, in the background, this ends up to be varying another variant, basically, of the component which we can select. Um, and if we do that, and uh, let IntelliJ also recognize this change, we can go back to our test. And now we already see that there's a suggestion here to import <laughs> to import uh, this static method we have defined over here in our test fixture. If we navigate there, we see that was the method defined inside the data project. And this is separated uh, now. It's a separate set of sources. It's also a separate set of classes in the end. It's also a separate jar if you export this. So one thing we can do, if, or we just can show, if we publish this again, right? Because another thing is what the test fixtures program is doing is also adding more information to the Java component and basically telling it, okay, we now have the test fixture variant. So let's just publish uh, our data component again. And if we go back and look at what ends up in our repository, um, we now see that there's another jar, which is the test fixture jar, and that contains this additional class we defined, and it's separate from our main jar. And if we look at our module file, we see, scrolling further down, so this is this block, right, where we had, in the, where we had all the variants in there. So we saw that these ones are there always, when we do Java projects or JVM projects. But down here we see that there are additional variants called test fixtures. Right? So we get also runtime and API variant for test fixtures. And here's this referencing this file. And there's also, we could also add more dependencies here. And these dependencies are only used by the test fixtures. And if I want to use like Guava, for example, only to have some utility classes to setting up my test data code, for example. Um, and because this is now published, um, this can be yeah, reused the same way as locally. So if I would, um, in, my, in my services now, instead of having here the project dependency, but have a dependency to something published, like you know, or Gradle Hello 6 data version 01, then I can still use this to pick the text test fixtures. Uh, yeah because they are published as well and they are marked as a different variant and Gradle knows then by this uh, which variant to pick. So, yeah, and that's about the test fixtures. So, again, we have a small summary for that to just put this back into context. So it's an additional plugin you apply on top of Java library. As I said before, if you also add Groovy or, or Kotlin, um, you can also apply that on top. And um, then it basically does some configuration of the, of the basics of the Java base based stuff, which is also used by Groovy and Kotlin. And um, yeah, if you just apply it without anything else, it just won't do anything, basically. Yeah. yeah. So you have this additional folder then, and there you put in your test fixture code. So for example, in Gradle, we use Groovy a lot for tests. So we could use Groovy here for test fixtures, but not use it for our main, uh, right. uh, main code. Yeah, and then if you want to use it, um, you depend on the project with the test fixtures keyword, but it can be published. So here in the example, I use Guava, but of course, they didn't publish test fixtures, but they also have something like that. I think there's a Guava test library, which is something like that. So they could publish it as fixtures, and you could select it like that. I want to show another, um, another feature in the production code, which is a bit related to test fixtures in the sense that um, yeah, it's technically or conceptually in the background, it uses the same mechanisms. And you will see some similarities. And that is called this feature is called feature variance. <laughs> a lot of feature, feature. Uh, and the use case for this is the following. So you develop a, some library, which you maybe also publish, and you have different users, like commonly common for open source libraries, for example. And then you might put in some features which some people use and some people don't. And maybe this feature <coughs> has separate dependencies, and so you don't want everyone to have these dependencies if they don't use the feature. Um, so this is what you can do now with, uh, with uh, feature variants. And, um, in the example, let's, let's look at an example to understand this use case better. So um, let's assume we have a second service uh, in our Java services project, um, the print loud hello from Java, which just prints stuff louder, right? Uh, uppercase and adding some exclamation mark in the end. And to add this very complex thing to adding exclamation mark, 
We also want to use a utility from uh, the common slang library. Um, now, how can we do that? We could put this class just next to our other service, but then everyone would get this uh, additional dependency. And if you don't, but if you don't use this loud service, you don't need it. So it would really be nice if we could like, separate these two services, which aren't really directly connected, right? Um, so for this, we can define a, a feature, and that works like this: uh, you go into this Java plugin configuration, and then you can say, "I want to have a new feature," which you do by register feature. We call our feature loud, and then what you need to do is. Uh, tell Gradle where the sources of the feature are. You might have already noticed that I created a separate folder here uh, called loud. And we have seen this in test fixtures actually already. So for Gradle, this is a source set or resource uh, source set. Yeah. And we can create additional source sets. Um, there are different APIs for this. But we have this nice API creating with a Groovy DSL. So we can say loud. Kotlin DSL, yeah. <laughs> Too much different JVM languages today. Yeah. And then we can use it. And this name uh, corresponds to the folder name. Yeah. So by this, I um, mm, ah, I had to have to use by yeah, this delegated property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's a really nice thing about using the Kotlin DSL, right? That uh, it can insert some of these things for you. Yeah. Uh, so you don't need to, in this case, you don't really need to repeat the name again and have to be careful that it's always the same and so on. So, yeah, you see now when I report this in IntelliJ, I have this mark the source folder and I have this class now. I haven't yet added the dependency. Same problem as before. So, but the good thing is now I don't need to add this to implementation so everyone would see this. But I have new configurations here now for my feature. So I don't, unfortunately, don't have nice code completion for them because they are added dynamically while Gradle is configuring the build. But during running the build, I will get an, a message if something is wrong. So what I have is not test implementation, is what I have here, right? <laughs> but I get loud implementation because my feature is called loud. It's a naming convention. And then I can add the dependency to Apache Commons Lang. So, uh, Lang 3, uh, I think 3.7 is the latest. And I also need a dependency to the data project because it's completely separated. Um, I also need to redefine it here. So maybe this feature does, wouldn't, doesn't need the data, then I wouldn't need it. And so I also have loud API. So let's see if this works. So if I define these and go back to our class, we see that now everything is available here. And to see a bit more of the effect of this, um, we will actually want to use the second service. Um, so if we just go into our application, which makes use of the Hello Java service already, um, we can see here, let's remove this one, just did for testing before. Um, I see that the, this service is not yet available here because I def defined a separate feature. So it's a separate source set. It's actually a separate jar in the end if I compile this and package this. So I need to depend on it explicitly. And by this, I, by, by this, I can decide if I really need the feature or can Gradle if I really need it. And then Gradle will also know do I need the dependencies or not. Um, so by do, doing this, is, or this is done by depending on um, similar to test fixtures, actually, depending on the project again. Yeah. So by test fixtures, we had this test fixture, which is actually just a core shortcut for selecting the test fixture um, variant. And for an arbitrary feature variant, we have to open the configuration block here again. And we have this concept called capabilities for that. Um, can't go into all details of that uh, now, but it's uh, basically giving a name or a coordinate to a feature. So we can say, I require another capability from this um, Java, Hello Java service. So the Hello Java service now basically has two capabilities. One is there by default, um, which is uh, referring to the main content, which every library has. And now we have an additional one by def defining the feature and the background Gradle builds this all up. 
And so we need to use the coordinates here we have um, uh, reused uh, also for publishing. So this is our group and the name is, I'll just copy it from here, Hello Java Service. And now there's Hello Java Service Loud um, because this is derived from the name we gave to the feature. And if we now um, re-import this and let the dependencies resolve, we see now it's available and um, that's really good. And to just uh, show that this is really like um, uh, yeah, coming in via this other dependency, we can look at the um, class path again, but this time we use a build scan for that. So many of you know build scans, some of you use the build scan plugin as I told us. Um, so, so build scan is uh, yeah, connected to our commercial product, Gradle Enterprise, but there's a free installation of it on scans.gradle.com which you can use. I get a private URL here which contains information about your build that is recorded during running the build. Um, so it's very uh, good to debug certain things. So, um, and because one thing the build scan has is this dependency tab where you can look in your dependencies. And you see here that I actually see the compile and runtime class bus here that was used during my build, which we also looked uh, at the console before. And now you see here that I have these two variants of Hello Java service selected. So I have the API elements and loud API elements. It's, it's the name is also derived from the name of the feature. And if we open these, we see, okay, nothing in here because it's a compile class pass. But if we look at the runtime class pass, we see, okay, this one used Guava, so it came in from here. And this one uses Lang and coming from here. And if I remove one of these again, I won't have the corresponding dependencies. Yeah, so it's really separated features in one component. It's when you for a lot of interesting things. So there are some more use cases and examples in our documentation for, for what this can be used for. Nice. So, um, yeah, so these slides only basically show what we've seen in the demo before, how you define the thing with the register feature and how you use it. Uh, so you use this required capability and um, you can use it for like yeah, a local project dependency or you could also use it for something that's published. So if I would publish my service, I would get the features as well, separate jar, similar to what we saw with the test fixtures basically. And if I have a library, an open source library, um, I could also have these things, right? For example, Juice we used and Juice has actually a different variant published, a separate jar, which are without AOP things in there. So it doesn't publish this information, right? That it's there and that it's another feature. Um, but if it would, we could select it like this. And one thing we can do actually is we add a rule to Gradle to add this missing information, which is something we want to quickly talk about next. Maybe we won't have time to show it right now, yeah. but uh, there's a lot of documentation about how to do this. Uh, maybe a blog post that's coming soon. Yeah. Uh, sure. But yeah, maybe just show it real quickly. Yeah, so maybe I just show one effect of this. So um, we can write rules for different things. So one thing I've prepared is a rule for Guava and I said this before that Gradle is looking at the like Java version and we had this problem with, with Guava that it publishes these two different versions, Java 8, Java, um, Java 6. Um, so if I look at our application, I added a little task here. I think it's check Guava. Yeah, so just to help us to see which jar is actually used. So we see the GIE jar is used. Um, but now, so we apply the rule to actually extend the metadata of Guava, which is done here. So I won't show the implementation of the rule, but it's all in our documentation. So and here's the place where it defines the Java version. So we use 13 now. But if I switch this to 6 and run the check again, we can see that the other jar is picked because these are now um, known as two different variants with different Java version and Gradle automatically picks the one that fits best. So in case of certain, it picks the eight, the eight one and lower one. If I would move even lower, it would fail, telling me there's nothing it can pick if I would go on Java 5 or something. Yeah, so yeah, so there are a lot of examples in our documentation. We will leave the slide with the links for you to look at it later. And this is just what we just saw with the Guava rule. Okay. So we, we had a, a a chance to talk a lot about uh, dependency management in the, the little bit of time we have left. 
Uh, I want to talk about some of the other nice things about uh, Gradle 6, particularly how it uh, affects other tool chains. Going to real quickly uh, do a poll here because we're going to need to uh, make some decisions about what to, to follow up on. So I'll leave this up for a little bit about which languages you're most interested in. This is a, a multi-select, so if you're using more than one, please uh, feel free to, to select more than one. Okay. So we have a, a fair distribution here, uh, some, a lot of Groovy and Kotlin folks, as I, I would expect, especially uh, uh, if, if you're using Android or something with, with Kotlin. Uh, a, few, a few Scala folks who will probably see some improvements. Uh, and unfortunately for our C and C++ folks, uh, there are some, some interesting changes that you'll want to read on our, our website about uh, improvements there, mostly in the, in the 5X series. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. yeah, lots of people just, just using uh, yeah. Java. But yeah. let's uh, continue then. So kind of, kind of the important things here is that we've uh, standardized uh, on a lot of things, especially when you want to, uh, to use multiple together. So if you want to use the, the Groovy and the Scala plugins together, uh, it, it works a lot better. Both applies down to the, the Java base plugin, uh, and, and you could do this with, with Kotlin too. The next kind of interesting thing is, of course, as you've seen throughout this uh, presentation, we have been using JDK 13, which is uh, pretty pretty simple to do uh, using some configuration. We'll publish all of this afterwards. Yeah. The uh, yeah. kind of kicker here is that you want to make sure that if you're using any of the uh, the extra or you need an extra flag like enable preview, uh, that you add this to each thing, uh, including the Java doc that's yeah. down here. Yeah. The uh, kind of cool thing that we've done about uh, Groovy compilation, uh, which we will uh, show, I'll, I'll just talk over while you do the, okay. the demo for that. Okay, cool. uh, so, so Groovy compilation is something that we started uh, to, to use internally uh, to do this inc incremental compilation. So what we mean by incremental compilation is that uh, it's going to only, uh, only affect the things that have not changed, uh, or yeah. Right. Re reuse what we can and, and only uh, recompile what, what has changed, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and so maybe the, the easiest way to, to show this is the, the example that we've prepped. So uh, yeah, you've got this really slow compilation step that's going to run, uh, and then uh, when you enable incremental compilation, it's going to get a lot faster. Yeah, so yeah, we can just run this um, compilation of the project to show that it's really slow. Um, um, no, I have to think. So that's another of our service project we have prepared, a Ruby service project. And well, let's say, okay, we want to run the test actually, but for running the test, we need to compile everything. So, yeah. Um, ah, I'm on Java 6 still. It doesn't, Java 13 doesn't like me to be on Java 6. <laughs> so I should change that's that back. Yeah, so what we will see is that this is really slow compiling, so it's like emulating a project with a lot of Groovy classes in it. And um, yeah, the situation we actually had in, at Gradle itself is that we uh, mentioned before, um, use uh, Groovy a lot in tests. So each time we test, change just a test or just one class, um, it took quite a long time. Um, yeah, so, so here we have this hello, another service similar to the other one implemented, and if we change something here, like just mm -hmm. adding some variable. You see that recompilation um, will take quite some time because it's compiling everything and um, we don't have to wait for it. Uh, but what we see is that there's actually no dependency to any class in the project, yeah, just to our hello message class from the other project. Um, so we can turn on incremental compilation, which is quite easy. Just tell the Groovy compile task to be incremental with this option. and then we just have to run it one time with it turned on, so that's the first time. Uh, well, that, well, was, so that, was, that was up to date. <laughs> uh, sorry, that was not smart, so let's yeah. just change something else here. Um, so the first time you run it with incremental on, it will still compile everything again, mm -hmm. or not. <laughs> so it was quite fast, so maybe it worked already, maybe because I ran it before, okay. So you see that it's much, much faster now, and um, yeah, so basically just recompiling things that need to be recompiled by knowing, by Gradle knowing what things are related. So it's using a similar mechanism in the background as the Java incremental compilation, which has been around for some time already. And you can also enable this flag uh, 
compile avoidance with kind of doing the same thing across projects so it doesn't recompile if you don't use any classes from another project. It knows directly it doesn't need to do anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so, so these are things that you need to turn on because they're still uh, in the beginning stages. Uh, like, like we said, we've been using it internally, uh, yeah. and so we wanted to share that with everyone so that they can take advantage of this. But if you uh, turn this on and you start seeing uh, some problems or edge cases, uh, please report it, just like everything we've been talking about today. Uh, please file GitHub issues when you, when you notice bugs or, or things that, uh, that we should fix, uh, and, or maybe search for it first because you might find that someone already has a workaround. Uh, yeah, so uh, for the Scala folks, we, we made some changes to the, the compiler there, upgraded some versions, check out the release notes if you want to learn more. The yeah. kind of last thing that we have a couple minutes to talk about is what's new for plugin authors. So there's two main things that I want to talk about uh, for plugin authors. The first is that uh, we have a, a Gradle init task to start a template uh, for your, your plugin. So if you or just getting started, you don't uh, have a place to start, or maybe you're just tired of uh, kind of the boilerplate uh -huh. uh, setup for a task, you should start with Gradle init, uh, pick this uh, option for the Gradle plugin, and then you can pick any language. So this is kind of what's new in the, the Gradle 5X series, oh. is that now instead of just Java, we have templates for Groovy and Kotlin too. The next option is to pick the, uh, the build script DSL, because uh, of course you can, you can mix and match. So you can use Groovy source code, Kotlin DSL, Kotlin uh, DSL and Groovy, or vice versa. And, and so what we get here is a, is a template. So uh, you get uh, functional tests, uh, which is of course good practice to, to test any code. But this is of course one of the things about uh, making plugins too, because when, you, when your build scripts get really big, you want to start abstracting this stuff out so that you can, uh, you can test it, uh, share it, and, and just follow good practices overall. So starting with the Gradle init task and then maybe moving into some other things uh, that we can do with uh, Gradle 6, including uh, getting lazier, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we can... Uh, take advantage of, of some of the things uh, in the, the lazy properties, uh, or man sorry, managed properties, which are, are lazily configured. Uh, and it, what we mean here is that we have an abstract property called input uh, that's all declared in our, in our build source file for this custom task. Then if we want to use that in our, our build.gradle.kts file, because uh, of course we, we can mix and match, uh, all we have to do is input.set. But it doesn't have to be a string. We can, of course, use the provider API or anything more complex as well. Uh, hopefully this has been a, a little bit helpful uh, so that you can, can rewrite or maybe uh, if you're starting out uh, with a, a new plugin, you, you take advantage yeah. of some of these things in Gradle 6. Yeah, so basically you don't define getters and setters. You just define this abstract property and Gradle will do everything else for you. And you can not only define a concrete value, but also providers, which is a la lazy yeah, the lazy way of, of yeah. configuring things. So, yeah, so it's a really good, if you start like with plugin development or writing own tasks, it's a really good thing to use directly. Yeah. Nice. Uh, there's, of course, some, some other things about uh, worker API and uh, some things you can read in the documentation. Uh, let's see, what else we should? Yeah, so there are some new services that you can inject now, especially for very common tasks like doing something on file system or executing other processes. So yeah, just a reminder also that the worker API is there. If you use very do expensive tasks in your custom implementation, then you can use that to spawn separate processes or isolate or run things in parallel. And there are some, well, over the time of between five and six, there are a lot of improvements and stabilizations on this and additions. Yeah. yeah. So, and then I just wanted to mention that we talked about the, uh, the very long time about dependency management, actually. And uh, so I mentioned several times and also showed it, it was seen in the metadata that this is all based on the idea that a component has variants and we can select different variants or even multiple variants depending on the context we are in. So do we compile, do we run, um, do we have a certain flavor on Android or something like that? So that's all now based on this mechanism. And if you write your own plugins and have something to do with dependencies by depending on standard library or any other thing where other things come in, you might want to look at this in more detail and see how you can leverage it actually to, to make things better or more automatic, basically by automatically selecting the right thing depending on the context you the user uses your plugin in. 
So some examples already using that for a long time actually is Android and also Kotlin Native is making heavy use of the metadata format already actually. And there's also more to come in Android concerning publishing in the next, in the next version. Um, yeah, so uh, here are some links to the docs for that, as I mentioned. And yeah, I think that. Yeah, I mean, the, the docs are going to be the, the best place to get started on a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, we only had a, a short amount of time to, to go through all of this information. Uh, we did spend a long time on dependency management because that is uh, a major part of what's new in Gradle 6 and some of the things that uh, we really want you to know and, and start upgrading and, and changing. Uh, particularly uh, the, this module metadata format and, and stuff like that. Uh, we, of course, could go into this for, for hours and, uh, and Cedric and Louis certainly have because uh, we have three recorded webcasts here that uh, we're going to send out to you as, or you'll get a link in the slides, uh, that uh, go into a lot more detail, starting with some of the features that were introduced in Gradle 5, going all the way up through uh, Gradle 6, uh, and well, Gradle 601 that was released yesterday for yeah. all of the Android uh, users out there that uh, noticed that bug in 6.0 and want to upgrade to 6.01. Uh, and if you want to learn more about stuff like this, uh, go to, to gradle.com slash training. We have regular uh, introductions to Gradle as well as some more advanced trainings, uh, especially on that, that cache optimization. We've got a, a really good training on that uh, that you can, can take advantage of. So uh, I think I left about two minutes for questions. Uh, and I. I have been reading through a few of them as we've been going. So yeah. the first one that I, I wanted to throw out there is a, a question about the difference between the Kotlin DSL and the Groovy DSL. Mm -hmm. So people are, are asking uh, kind of where we are because that was a big feature in Gradle yeah. 5. We, we released uh, the Kotlin DSL uh, and, and so hopefully people have seen that we've been using it uh, mm -hmm. pretty heavily in all of these demos. Yeah. Uh, so, so kind of what, what's your opinion on, on where we are with that? Well, it's definitely something you, you can use in your projects. I mean, if you start a new project, I would definitely recommend it, especially because of the IDE experience. Um, so a lot of things are, yeah, are easier to get into because you have the code completion in much more places now. Um, and if you already yeah, have, a, have a project you are working with, um, I would also recommend at least looking at it. I think it's a bit an individual case, um, how, you, how used, how used are you to Groovy, for example? So if you use to Groovy, it might be easier for you to use it. Um, but you can also just try starting it out. For example, if you have a multi-project, you can just turn one project into the Kotlin DSL. So com combining both in one thing is not a, not a problem. We do that in our own build also, and we also have most of it migrated actually a large build, the Gradle build itself, from Kot Gro Groovy to Kotlin. So yeah, so there's really I think both can be used really. And so it depends a bit on your personal preference, but in general, I would prefer or recommend to use Kotlin because of the IDE experience. Oh, and of course, an apology to everyone who's already using Gradle 6 and was not represented in our poll. <laughs> uh, <laughs> congratulations to you. Um, Sorry for that. Uh, yeah, that's totally, totally my fault. Uh, okay, Kotlin for build scripts, configuration. Yeah, so we, we explained the differences between API and configuration. Uh, yes, we did call it application and not Java application, and we'll probably regret that forever. Uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, the differences between the Spring Dependency Management plugin and uh, yeah. and the, the module metadata, because that's a, that's a really good uh, thing yeah. to, to talk about. That's a good point, and the question that uh, might come up, you could also run into problems if you're publishing and using the plugin now, um, depending on what you do, because um, it's not aware of Gradle module metadata yet. Um, so, but you can do a lot of things with, um, with Gradle natively now, and that's also what we recommend, and I think the Spring guys are also fine with that recommendation. Um, so basically, if you use the plugin and you use the dependency management block, which is very similar to what we saw in the POM file, um, you are defining dependency constraints from greater perspective. So you could as well define dependency constraints like we did here. And it's, it's basically, it has the same effect, only that Gradle knows about the fact that it's a constraint and not something that's just added by plugin somehow. So we can publish it correctly also to Gradle module metadata. And if you use uh, the Java platform plugin and publish, and we've actually seen that, you also get a bomb published and it contains a dependency management block like here. 
and yeah, that's basically basically it. And if you use a plugin to import a bomb, um, you can just do that now by using a platform dependency as we have shown on the slide. So yeah, so it would it's a preferable way to use the Gradle APIs they are available because then Gradle just has more knowledge what you want to do and can use it in different places. And it's a bit more performant. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's also true. Yeah, that's also a factor if you have really large builds and you can, should consider trying it and see if the performance improves. Yeah. Hi, here's a, a, a decent question. So, or a, a good question. Is there any uh, parser to read the, the new module metadata format? Um, no, not as a public API at the moment. Um, so I mean, in general, it's JSON if you want to pull something out directly. But the format we have there and the information is, is basically a serialization, serialization of Gradle's internal model. So for example, if you write such a component metadata rule, which we haven't shown because you know, it's also complex and we yeah. ran out of time a little bit. <laughs> um, but I can just show this is a rule for Guava, which we use, but you get what you get in here is basically the metadata that was read from the repository. And that's basically all the information that's in the module file. So in such a rule, you can access all this information and do something with it if you, yeah, if you like. So that's basically the, the place in Gradle at the moment where you can get the rawest form of this, of this format. But there's also, yeah, so it's JSON, there's also a specification officially where you can look into if you like want to pass it yourself for some reason. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question about upgrading. So, uh, like, what do you recommend for moving to the new Gradle version? So, uh, there is a, so there's some really nice documentation. So we have an, an upgrade guide depending yeah, on what version of, of yeah. Gradle you're starting with. Uh, but the, the main thing here is to actually start with a Gradle build scan because there's a deprecations view. So if you, uh, switch to, to Gradle 6, uh, you'll, you'll get some information about kind of what's been uh, deprecated uh, and what, what you need to fix. Yeah, that's true. So it's really, if you can use build scans, it's really nice, especially to find places. So for example, if you use a lot of compile, you will get um, probably a lot of deprecation warnings and that will all be shown. So um, yeah, you can also print them out on the console, but um, it's also a nice way if you have many things in large build, uh, to find all the places. It's something I used actually in the Gradle build itself when we upgraded it to 6. Because <laughs> we also still had quite a lot of usages of it. So. so can different Scala versions be supported with feature variants? And maybe this is a question yeah. about JVM languages yeah. in general. Yeah, so it's right? a very good question and it's something we haven't ourselves looked in detail, but something that's on our list of things to look at because it's really a very good use case for that and I'm, I'm convinced that it can. Okay. I, I haven't looked at how to move there yet, but um, I think it's possible. It might also be an idea to start to like write a plugin with these component metadata rules that kind of translate what was already published, where there are like several modules um, to translate them like into one with all the variants, which is basically what the Guava rule was doing for Guava. So I think you could do something quite similar and improve the Java pl uh, the Scala plugin with it. So please feel free to try things out and uh, contact us about it if you are interested in this. So is, is the idea that the new Gradle module metadata file uh, format, uh, is the idea that it's going to replace Maven, uh, Maven bombs and palms? Well, in a way, if you look at, at Gradle, I mean, on the long run, it's, it's the idea. So if you use Gradle and are in the Gradle world that you use that. So what we, what we have seen in the demo and shown is once you use Gradle 6 and this published Gradle we use the information from there, it will only use the POM to see that something exists. But of course, if you are like publishing libraries for, for the whole world, like open source library, and you are also concerned about other build tools like Maven, um, then I think POM will stay around for a long time there. And we did um, yeah, a lot of effort actually put into the POM publishing. So the Maven published plugin will also publish, always publish a POM and it will put as much information as it can into the POM. And if it can't put in certain information, you will also get some warnings. So you can maybe use some tweaking of the POM file. There are some tricks so you can achieve certain things there. So if you are concerned with others, other tools, then this is really helpful. But if you are only in the Gradle world, um, so the idea is in the Gradle, in, in the closed Gradle world, we are relying on this format yeah, in the future. Uh, let's see, so next, uh, can you publish multiple, or I guess, and consume as well, multiple Java platforms in a single project? Definitely, yeah. And that's yeah. a major difference from Maven, right? Because you can only uh, consume from one, one parent. Um, I'm not, not no, as much no. of a reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can actually, in Gradle, in Maven, you have the concept of importing bombs, so you can also import many there. 
But the problem is you can't publish this information. So if you do it in library, then the, the one using the library has to do it again. So and that's one advantage actually that you can also publish these dependencies, but you can have as many as you want. And you can like say, okay, I have a platform for tests, a platform for, for my runtime code or something. Platforms can also depend on another platform. It's all just another thing in our dependency management, like another component just of a specific type. So this is all, all flexible, yeah. Okay. Oh, can constraints have exclusions or use exclusions? No, exclusions can only be defined on dependencies. The, uh, or the, the reasoning behind that from our perspective is that an exclusion is really something you, you decide when you depend on something and um, you know that you don't need some dependency down there. It's actually an indication that maybe the library you are using should have used feature variants if it could, because you ex if you need to exclude something explicitly, it's strange why is it there in the first place. So, but another thing about this topic is that often exclusions are used to solve other problems, because if you don't have the strict dependency, for example, and you can't downgrade, another way to solve this would just exclude the thing with the highest version. Yeah. yeah, so so we've also added something about this in the documentation of excludes now. So it's really recommended to look if you really need the exclude. There are certain cases where it's feasible, but in a lot of other cases, another solution is like better with Gradle now because then Gradle yeah, has the right information and um, you don't end up in a case where you, in some place the exclude is, uh, is gets, gets problematic if you move something else and so on, yeah. Sure, I understand this one. So is it possible to fetch metadata for dependencies? For dependency resolution, uh, Gradle by default uh, fetches the latest, but is there a way to get all versions of a dependency mm. based on the, the metadata? So you, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't exactly know the, the, the use case behind that, so probably if you want to do something yourself with the metadata, <laughs> I mean, it's usually you, you just want to have a result from the engine, so then um, you get what you have in the end. But Gradle, of course, processes um, also other, um, other versions if you request them. So if you depend on an explicit version, Gradle will also get, only get that metadata. But if you use a range, for example, we've seen the example, then, um, or there's also this plus notation, where you can say, look at everything, then Gradle will also get other, other, meta, other versions in the metadata. And there are other hooks where you can access this during dependency resolution in our documentation. Also these metadata rules, which we looked at, um, they are also executed for all the metadata need, Gradle needs to look at. So it depends a bit on the use case you want to solve, but there are possibilities to get this information from Gradle. Um, yeah, you can look at the, there's a section in the documentation about dependency management, which just talks about resolution engine APIs, and there you can find some other hooks to, to get into there if you, if you need that. Ah, can platforms define repositories, which I assume is define where they get published? Um, yeah, so I guess there are two interpretations of this. So if you publish, yes, that's also what I did here. So if you publish, you define where the platform is published, as we see other things. If you talk about resolving dependencies, so where do we get the yeah. dependencies from? So in Gradle it works like that, that you um, define the repositories in, in the project you're working on. So if I ask the application to run and compile, it will use the repositories that were defined in the application project. But you can also do dependency to repository matching. Yes, that's something you can also do now. So you can say, okay, just look for certain reports in the, in the repository. So it doesn't really make sense to define it in the platform because the platform alone, if it only contains constraints, you can't do anything there. But um, it doesn't hurt. I mean, the Gradle wouldn't break or something. So what I did, for example, in the sample project is I just defined the same repositories for all sub-projects, which includes the platform project, and it won't like break things. It's just not, not applicable in this case, no. I would say. So this is a, a bit of a, a contested thing that we've been talking about internally. So how would you use automatic versioning, so like snapshots uh, on publishing using the Maven Publish plugin? So, so you can use snapshot versions, and that is just well supported by the Maven Publish plugin, so that you then get you you say it's a version of snapshot, but then the actual file has a timestamp, mm -hmm. which is like the normal Maven mechanism, um, which you also maybe want to use because you use have Maven consumers or something. In general, we are kind of recommending to not use snapshots, but use your own versions because it's then clearer which version was used. Snapshot is a bit like a moving target. You depend on snapshot and you're never sure what you get in the end. 
So then, so my recommendation would be to, um, so here you define the version and you can just set this property dynamically, right? If you say, okay, like having a flag saying, okay, I'm now in snapshot release mode at the moment, and then automatically append a timestamp here, for example, by getting the current time or something like that. And I think there's yeah. even some community plugins that can help you do that. Yeah, I'm sure there are, yeah, yeah. And by in general, yeah, you can look which pattern fits you best, but the snapshot mechanism of Maven is also supported. So that is all the time that we have for today. Uh, if you have further questions, uh, feel free to, to connect with us on, on uh, other forums. Uh, we have, yeah, of course, the, the Griddle forums, uh, some community Slack and, and other things. Uh, and yeah, yeah get, keep an eye out for that recording uh, and the, the slides that'll come with it when you get that email. Yeah. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you uh, very much.